Hello and welcome. Gosh, I don't know what is more exciting to talk about, parasitology or mycology, but I kind of like mycology. And mycology is the study of yeast and molds. So let's go ahead and get started. There are a number of different types of samples that you can get into the laboratory to examine for fungal elements. And those types of samples would be skin and nails, hair, exudate, uh, urogenital samples, sputums, and body fluids. Those are just a few examples. So the first thing we want to do when we get those samples is a direct microscopic exam. And there's a number of different types of stains and wet preps that we can use for that. So for example, we can do an unstained wet prep where we're just taking a little bit of the sample and putting it in some saline and we're looking on it on very low light at 40X. And we're looking for mycelial fragments, spores, or budding cells. We can do what's known as a potassium hydroxide exam. What that does is it actually destroys skin, hair, and nails, making the fungal elements um, appear um, easier or making them easier to see. And sometimes you can combine this with a fluorescent stain known as calcaflor. Then there's the gram stain where fungal elements retain the crystal violet. Even though they have a different cell wall than bacteria do, they do restain they do retain the crystal violet and they will stain dark purple. Then there's a histolog histological stain known as the Gomori methanine silver nitrate stain. And this is a special fungal stain where the fungal elements appear black and the debris and the cells in the background appear green. And then finally we have the India ink prep where we're looking for the capsules surrounding Cryptococcus species. And I'll be able to show you a few pictures of these in the next slide. So here's some images of fungal elements with different types of direct examinations. The top left is a gram stain where you can see the fungal element is the dark purple element in the middle. The pink elements in the background are actually the lobes of white cells. On the bottom left, this is a cryptococcal India ink stain where you can actually see the capsule around um, Cryptococcus neoformans. And then the middle image on the top would be a calcifloor potassium hydroxide stain where you're using a fluorescent microscope and fungal elements stain green on a black background. And that's also um, noted in the bottom right image. The top right image are black fungal elements that appear on a green background and that is the Gomori methanamine silver nitrate stain, which is the stain of choice for fungal elements. So much of the way that we identify yeast and molds is by a microscopic exam. So there's a couple of medias that we want to use to identify yeast and molds. The best media that we can use is called Sabro dextrose auger. And this is a media of choice for the isolation and cultivation of yeast and funguses. But we do want to use a variety of different medias, hopefully causing the fungi to sporulate. That's the best way to identify funguses is by looking at them microscopically. So we might need certain media such as cornmeal auger, bird seed auger, or potato flake auger. And these are all just different miscellaneous medias that will contribute to our organism sporulating. Um, we also want to use cyclohexidine and chloramphenicol or even genomycin in the media because that's going to suppress the growth of any interfering bacteria. When setting up a fungal culture, we always want to make sure that the environment and atmosphere is um, correct to get funguses to grow optimally. So we want it in an aerobic environment, and most ye yeast and molds grow optimally at 30 degrees. However, you can get some molds to sporulate at 25 degrees Celsius, which is room temperature or body temperature, which is 35 degrees Celsius. But again, the idea is to get those stubborn molds to sporulate. Fungus can take a few days up to several weeks to grow. It just depends on the site of collection. For example, in a genital culture or a respiratory culture, we want to hold those, those cultures for at least two weeks. Toenails and spinal fluids take a little bit longer at four weeks, and then certain wounds take up to six weeks to grow certain molds. Macroscopically, yeast and molds look quite a bit different. Yeast kind of looks like a bacterial uh, organism on blood auger or sabs auger. It's moist, buterous, or butter-like. It may look macroscopically similar to large colonies of bacteria. 
Yeast are not always considered pathogens. Sometimes we can have yeast um, in the upper respiratory tract, and that's considered completely normal. Other times we can have yeast in the lower respiratory tract, um, especially in people who are mechanically ventilated. That can indicate that the yeast is a pathogen. Yeast grow fairly quickly compared to molds. They usually grow in a couple days at, at the most. And Candida albicans is the most common yeast isolated. 50% of the time or more, the, the yeast that's isolated in a clinical laboratory is called Candida albicans. The other 50% of the time, it's miscellaneous yeast species. Yeast may demonstrate what's known as blastospores, chlamydospores, arthrospores, and or pseudohyphae depending on the species. And we'll talk more about that terminology in the next slide. A spore is also known as canidia. So you can have a blastospore, which is a single young spore or a single young canidia. Sometimes they're actually called blastocanidia. A terminal chlamydospore is a single spore on the end of Candida albicans pseudohyphae. And again, yeast don't make true hyphae, they make false hyphae, which are known as pseudohyphae. An arthrospore is a blocky, box-like spore, and a pseudohyphae is a long structure giving rise to canidia, but they are not true hyphae. Like I said, in most clinical specimens, Candida albicans is the yeast that's isolated. However, the other 50% of the time, you may be dealing with the different Candida species. There's actually 20 species of Candida. Some examples of that are Candida tropicalis, Candida parapsilosis, or Candida glabrata. Those are just a few examples out of the 20 species. Again, candida species can cause skin and nail infections and respiratory infections, including thrush, which is seen in immunosuppressed patients, especially HIV patients. Candida species can also cause genital or vaginal infections when a female has a yeast infection due to a um, pH change of the vagina. This is usually caused by candida species. And then another term that you need to be familiar with is invasive candidiasis. And that just basically means when candida takes over a certain body tissue. 50% of the time in the clinical laboratory, we isolate candida albicans. You can see in the upper left image that under the microscope, you can see what look like pseudohyphae, which are the long slender parts of the yeast. And then at the end, um, terminally, you have what's known as chlamydospores. That's only going to be seen in Candida albicans. On the upper right image, you can see that Candida albicans is starting to sell, stellate or appear fritzy, and that can happen within the first 24 hours of initial growth. And then on the bottom left, you can see that Candida albicans almost looks like a, almost looks like a Staphylococcus species. They're white, buterous, um, kind of opaque looking, just like a staph would look. The germ tube test is the best single test to identify candida albicans. Basically what we're doing is we're taking a half a milliliter of um, bovine serum and then we're adding one to two colonies of our unknown yeast. We're going to incubate that for two to three hours at body temperature, 35 degrees, and then we will wet prep it by taking a colony and a little bit of saline, putting a cover slip on it, and viewing it with low light at 40x. Germ tubes that are present are half as wide and three to four times as long as the chlamydospore. And I'll show you an image of what a germ tube looks like. There's no point of constriction at the junction of the mother cell and the germ tube. So stay tuned for the next slide where I show you what germ tubes look like. So Candida albicans is the only yeast that will make germ tubes. And if you can see on the image on the left, Candida albicans almost looks like lollipops. You have the mother cell, which is the yeast cell, and then coming out of that cell is what's known as the germ tube. There's no point of constriction between the pseudohyphae and the mother cell. There's also positive germ tubes in the image on the upper right. If you look down at the bottom right, this is an image of a yeast that is not Candida albicans. This is probably Cryptococcus or Torulopsis glabrata. This is an example of Blastocanidia only. There are no terminal chlamydospores. The terminal chlamydospore is actually the yeast cell once it's attached to the germ tube. 
Cryptococcus neoformans is a pathogen. It produces a capsule and there are very few yeasts that will do that. It causes primary lung infections and it especially can be problematic in AIDS patients. It is highly associated with pigeon poop. So if you live in a very populated area with many pigeons, you can actually get exposed to Cryptococcus neoformans and develop a lung infection. In AIDS patients, this often spreads to the cerebral spinal fluid. And once that happens, you have a life expectancy of about two years. Now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about fungi or molds. And we need to be familiar with some of the terms associated with molds. Canidia are spores. They're asexual spores of fungi that come from canidophores, an external structure. We have microconidia and macroconidia, and basically those are just small versus large canidia. And I'll show you some pictures of that upcoming. We have sporangiospore, which is pretty much like a spore or a canidia, but they're in, contained inside of a sac called a sporangia. We have a vesicle, which is the swollen end of a hyphae, and sterigmata, which are flask-shaped structures of the mold. We have hyphae, which can be septated or aseptated, which basically means they can be without sections or they can have sections, and they're tubular filaments from which a spore develops. We have mycelium, which is a group of hyphae, and they can be vegetative or reproductive in nature. We have dimorph, as in dimorphic fungus, where it is a yeast in the body and a mold outside of the body. And then we have spores and sporulation, typically a single cell structure used in asexual reproduction that is called a spore. And again, we can also call those canidia. So the word blastospore is synonymous with blastokinidia. Chlamydospore is the same as chlamydokinidia, and arthrospore is the same as arthrokinidia. So here's a nice drawing that kind of outlines the different asexual spores of fungi. The upper left, you can see canidium, which are just the spores coming off the long structure known as the canidiophore. The structure on the bottom going vertically is the hyphae, and you can see it is, it's divided into segments, and so that's called a, a, a septated hyphae. On the upper right, we have arthrospores that look like boxes. That is typical of a yeast known as geotricum and a very bad mold known as coccidioides. In the middle, we've got a chlamydospore. On the end, it's called a terminal chlamydospore, and in the middle, it's called a subterminal chlamydospore. Bottom left, we've got little canidia and big canidia, and those are called microcanidia and macroconidia. On the middle bottom, we've got a, an example of aspergillus, where you can see the canidia coming off the sterigmata, um, also known as a phyllid. That's a flask-shaped structure, structure attached to a vesicle or a canidiophore. And then finally, on the bottom right, we've got a sac known as the sporangium holding the spores known as sporangiospores, and they are connected to a structure known as the sporangiophore. And then at the bottom of that structure, we've got little roots. Those roots of the zygomycetes um, group of molds is called the rhizoid. Here we have an example of a microscopic examination of aspergillus, aspergillus under the microscope with the stain known as lactophenyl cotton blue. Here you can see the many structures of the aspergillus. You can see all the spores, which are the little circular structures known as canidia. Um, and then you have the sterigmata, which are kind of the little hands that hold the canidia. And then the bulbous section is called the vesicle. And below that, the long tubular structure is called the canidiophore. This is an example of aspergillus. In this picture, we have a dermatophyte, which is toenail fungus, and you can see you have long cigar-shaped um, elements that have sections, and that is a large canidia known as a macroconidia. The little tiny ones at the bottom right are called microconidia, which are just basically very small or mini canidia. Here we have an example of a mold group known as the zygomycetes. Here we've got the uh, sporangium, which is the sac that holds the spores, and those spores are called sporangiospores, and then the structure that holds the sporangia is called the sporangiophore. The 
The lactophenol cotton blue prep is a nice stain um, that is helpful for you to view the structures of fungi. It actually makes the different structures of the fungi turn blue so you're able to differentiate canidia from canidia 4, canidia 4 from hyphae. It just helps you see the structures better. And in the next slide, I'm going to tell you how to perform the lactophenol cotton blue. One thing that's nice is working with lactophenol cotton blue, you can do so outside of the um, biological safety cabinet because the phenol actually kills the spores of the mold. So we do want to start out in the safety cabinet until we've added the phenol to the sample. So using a safety cabinet or a hood, we remove the petri dish lid. Place one to two drops of lactophenol cotton blue on a slide and spread the stain out over the slide. Attach clear tape to your index finger and your thumb with the sticky side down and place the sticky side of the tape onto the sporulation area of the mold. Spores will actually attach to the tape. Place that tape then sticky side down onto the slide. At this point, the phenol has killed the spores and you can look at it on 10x and also 40x under the microscope and identify your mold. When identifying yeasts or molds, you can do um, a number of different tests that will help you especially identify yeasts. Like bacteria, molds and yeast can assimilate and ferment carbohydrates, they can reduce nitrates, and they have enzymatic potential. You can do antibody titers that can be performed on serum and spinal fluid to see if the patient has been exposed to an antigen. That's especially true in the case of Cryptococcus neoformans when you have an HIV patient. You can actually take their cerebral spinal fluid and form serial dilutions in order to see what their antibody titer is. You can also perform biochemical, enzymatic, and serological tests to identify these molds. The gold standard, however, for identifying fungi or molds is to use lactophenol cotton blue and view it under the microscope. Let's go ahead and cover the five fungal classes. We've got the dermatophytes, which are the toenail funguses, the highland saprobes, which are aspergillus and penicillium, We've got the dematiaceous molds, which are the darkly pigmented molds. We've got the zygomycetes, which are your quick growing resistant molds. And we have the dimorphs, which are a yeast in vivo and a mold in vitro. Let's go ahead and start with everybody's favorite fungus, the dermatophytes. And these are the ones that cause uh, ringworm, athlete's foot, and jock itch. Um, they like to grow on the skin, hair, and the nails. And there's a couple conditions um, associated with the dermatophyte infections. One is called tania capitis, and I always think of this as, as a fungal infection on your cap. So it's on your scalp, um, and that's usually caused by microsporum canis or trichophyton rubrum. And then we've got tania barbae, which is a condition um, associated with fungus of the beard. And then we've got tania corporis, which is a skin infection caused by trichophyton. Okay, so just keep in mind, Tania capitis, Tania barbae, and Tania corporis, those are not organism names. Those are actually associated uh, or conditions associated with the dermatophyte infection. So let's go ahead and talk about some of the dermatophytes in the next coming slides. So here are three images of different dermatophytes that I thought were significant enough to talk about. We've got trichophyton species, and you can see in the image there on the left that we've got long macroconidia, and those macroconidia are divided into eight to ten uh, sections, and there are microconidia present. So if you were to do a lactophenol cotton blue on that, you'd be able to recognize that because of the macroconidia and the microconidia. Microsporum, that's the image in the middle, is a little bit different. It has macroconidia that have thorny edges, and they have anywhere between 4 and 15 septations, but they also have microconidia. And then on the right, we've got epidermophyton, which is a fungus um, that causes jock itch, and it actually um, has kind of these rounded shaped macroconidia and they only have two to four septations and there are, are no microconidia present. So again, if you take a try, look at trichophyton, this is an organism that causes hair and nail infections. Um, it causes a fungal infection known as athlete's foot. 
And then we've got microsporum, specifically microsporum canis, which causes ringworm. So ringworm is not a worm, it's actually a fungus, a fungal infection. And then finally, we've got epidermophyton on the right, and that is the cause of jock itch. Let's move on to the next fungal class, and that would be the hyaline saprobes. If you're, if you're not sure what hyaline means, it actually means transparent or non-pigmented. And here we're referring to the spores or the conidia. They are non-pigmented. So the hyaline saprobes, these are what you're most likely to come across living in your refrigerator, okay? They are saprophytic, which means that they live on dead or decaying organic matter. A lot of times you'll see these growing on fruits and vegetables in your refrigerator or on your bread. It's not usually a source of human disease. They are opportunistic organisms, and they are common contaminants on your microbiology plates. Um, again, spores or conidia are in the atmosphere and they can blow onto your plate and contaminate them. And these are what's known as the non-pigmented molds. So two of the most common hyaline saprobes are penicillium and aspergillus species. Penicillin is actually made from penicillium mold. Uh, just a fun little factoid for you there. It is aspergillus and penicillium that you're most likely to see on your bread that's gone ba bad in your pantry. They're both rapid growers. Um, there are a few species of aspergillus that are slow growers, but for the most part, they're rapid growers, and they'll grow on your microbiology plates within a few days. Penicillium is macroscopically shades of blue or bluish green. They have a velvety or powdery surface, and the canidia look like paintbrushes. Aspergillus, on the other hand, there's many color varieties, including slate blue, cinnamon brown, and black, and that's macroscopically. Their consistency is velvety to cottony, and under the microscope, they look like dandelion heads. Okay, so it's important when identifying any mold that you look at it macroscopically and that you also look at it microscopically. So let's take a look at some pictures of penicillium and aspergillus. The top left image is a lactophenol cotton blue stain of a penicillium. These are what we call the paintbrushes. There's long chains of canidia attached to the canidiophore. In the upper middle, Picture, this is an example of what penicillium looks like growing on your media macroscopically. On the bottom left, we've got a cinnamon brown aspergillus growing, and the picture next to that is aspergillus tereus. And then the, the black colored organism on the bottom right is aspergillus niger, and microscopically it looks like the image on the upper right. That's aspergillus niger, it has the full dandelion head. And then the little blue image on the bottom right is Aspergillus fumigatus, and they say that those look like Bart Simpson heads. Aspergilliosis is an opportunistic disease. It's a respiratory disease that's caused by the mold Aspergillus, and there's actually 180 species of this mold. Some can be very sensitive to antifungal drugs, other ones can be very resistant. If you have aspergillosis, you often have wheezing, shortness of breath, a cough, and you may even cough up blood. And it is treated with corticosteroids and antifungals. The dematiaceous molds is the third group of fungal classes I want to talk about. They're the darkly pigmented fungi, and actually it's the melanin in the cell walls that cause their canidia to turn dark brown or black. They can be human pathogens causing diseases such as chromoblastomycosis and phaohyphomycosis. And those are fungal diseases that can spread to um, the lymph nodes. Um, they are associated with cysts and skin lesions. Chromoblastomycosis is not a dematiaceous mold infection that we see very often in this country. It is a chronic fungal disease of the skin, and it's more often seen in places like Madagascar or Brazil. Um, chromoblastomycosis is associated with the mold phylophoria or fonsicacia. Phaohyphomycosis is more common in the U.S. and is more associated with the black molds. It's more common 
um, in people that are immunosuppressed. And it is associated with black molds known as alternaria or cladosporium. And we'll take a look at those on the next slide. Alternaria and cladosporium are two of the dermatiaceous molds. They both produce dark pigmented macroconidia and microconidia. Alternaria is a rapid grower. You'll see multi-celled conidia with horizontal and vertical septations. I'll show you a picture of that coming up. The conidia are darkly colored and macroscopically um, it's dark and also has a woolly appearance and they form macroconidia that are chaining, and these are known as beaver tails. Cladosporium is more of a slow grower. You'll see chains of conidia, but they're oval shaped, and this is associated with certain types of conidia known as shield cells. So the top two images are alternaria. You can see on the top right that it's black and has a woolly type of texture. On the top image on the left, you can see darkly pigmented macroconidia that have vertical and horizontal septations, and they are chaining, and we call those the beaver tails. That's very typical of alternaria. On the bottom two images, you can see chains of oval conidia um, in cladosporium, and then you can see one, um, one oval conidia, I'm sorry, one conidia on the bottom right that attaches the oval conidia to the conidiophore, and that's called a shield cell. Very typical of cladosporium. The zygomycetes is the fourth class of fungus I want to talk about, and we affectionately call them the lid lifters. They can actually pop off, pop off your petri dish lid in a matter of hours, okay? So they are very rapid growers. Macroscopically, they're cottony or dirty white. To me, they look like little bunny tails. They can be very resistant to the antifungal drugs. They may or may not have roots. So um, one species is known as rhizopus. It actually has roots called rhizoids. And then there's other types of zygomycetes species as well, including mucor, abyssidia, and rhizomucor. Let's take a look at the zygomycetes in the next image. So in the upper left, we've got a zygomycetes growing on a petri dish, and you can see it kind of has a dirty white or cottony uh, texture. On the bottom left, you can see an example of rhizoids attached to the hyphae. On the upper right, you can see a sporangiophore with the sporangium and the sporangiospores are spilling out. And then on the bottom right, this is a rhizopus where it's um, the, the, the um, spores are black, the conidia are black, the um, sporangiophores are kind of grayish, and then at the bottom you've got your rhizoids, which are the roots. Some of the most significant fungal groups are, or funguses are in the group the dimorphs, and these are organisms that exist as a fungus at body temperature and a mold at room temperature, okay? or a yeast at body temperature and a mold at room temperature. They can cause a number of systemic fungal diseases and respiratory diseases such as valley fever, histoplasmosis, and blastomycosis. In order to identify the dimorph, you have to get the mold to convert to a yeast and you have to get the yeast to convert to a mold. So some examples of these significant molds are blastomyces dermatitidis, Coccidioides imitis and Histoplasma capsulatum. The image on the upper left is an image of Coccidioides. You can see arthrospores, which are the boxy spores, and then in between each boxy spore are little fragile cells known as disjunctor cells. And it's those disjunctor cells that break off when you breathe in these spores. If you take a look at the image on the bottom left, you can see a histiocyte with yeast from histoplasma in the tissue. And then we have tuberculate macroconidia on the right where you have histoplasma that's been converted to a mold. Coccidioides is primarily the reason why we never smell our plates unless we are told to do so by an instructor because coccidioides can cause a respiratory disease known as coccidiomycosis. 
and coccidioides is found in dry arid regions of the United States it's found in blowing dust and if you breathe it in you could develop coccidiomycosis Histoplasmosis is another opportunistic fungal disease, and histoplasm capsulatum is found in the central and eastern United States near the Ohio River Valley. And this is usually found in soil contaminated with bat guano or bat poop and bird droppings. All right, so that's a wrap. We've concluded our lecture on mycology. And I hope you learned a lot, and I hope you found it as interesting as I find it. And if you have any questions, you can get a hold of me. Have a great day.